Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. Today we continue a survey of the Old Testament looking at formation of the Old Testament. In other words, how do we get our Old Testament books? Now before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity, the privilege, the time, everything you've given us so we can study your word today. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. I have the notes up here on the board for you so you can follow along. The Old Testament was composed over a thousand year period spanning roughly from the mid second to the mid first millennium BC. So we're talking about 1500 to about 500 BC. Over 40 different authors have been identified as human authors. And with that, the New Testament does affirm that their writings were inspired by the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3.16 The text and transmission. The Old Testament was originally recorded in two languages, the classical or biblical Hebrew and the imperial Aramaic. Here we have some samples of it in these verses I list here, Genesis 31.47, Jeremiah 10.11. Ezra 4, 8 through 16, or 6, 18, and 7, 12 through 26. These verses are in Aramaic, or partially in Aramaic. Now, let's look at Jeremiah 10, 11 for a moment. It's the only verse in Jeremiah written in Aramaic. Here's what it says. Tell them this. These gods who did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. Of course, this is translated in English. But notice the statement. It's, it's a statement by God to all the people. And it's interesting because Aramaic was the language of the day. They call it the lingua franca. So let me read this. This statement could easily have been in Aramaic since this was, the, was lingua franca of that time. God gave a message to the nations in the common language of the people. So what we're saying is, this is a case when it's not in Hebrew. Most all the Old Testament is in Hebrew, except there is some Aramaic. That's one of the passages. There's also some in Ezra and also some in Daniel. If you study Daniel with me, uh, there was two or three chapters there. The authors range from the well-known Moses, David, and Solomon, and lesser-known authors contributed like Deborah in Judges 5.1 and Miriam. Exodus 15, 20 through 21. And if you go back and look at those passage, passages, you'll see that those are songs. Who both have songs and some non-Hebrews, Agar, Lemuel, and Job. Now we studied Job. He was from Uz, near or in Edom. There are some verses to show us where these men are uh, contributors to the Old Testament. Proverbs 30, verse 1, and 31, 1. There are five literary genres. I hope you've learned the, the word genre by, by now. A simpler de definition would be a, a style. When you talk about literature, they like to use the word genre. Law, historical narrative, poetry, wisdom, and prophetic utterance, or what we would call prophecy. The earliest writings of any kind, now we're not talking just about the Bible, but any writings predate, that means they're before 3000 BC, and are found both in ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. The first writings were pictograms using pictures representing objects. You've probably seen pictures of those and maybe some old movies that had Egypt in it, and they have pictures of maybe uh, 
a drawing of a man or maybe a bull. Those are, those are called pictograms. Then, ideograms, where pictures represented ideas. Both of these developed into a type of shorthand, so they learned how not to draw the whole thing, but sort of make an abbreviation of the drawing. Maybe instead of the whole house, they just drew the roof. People say, oh, well, that's a house, because that's the roof, you see. The final stage was from the, what they call a syllabic or the symbol writing system to using alphabetic scripts. So they went to, which was, they call the pictograms a kind of symbol. Then they went to using alphabets, where characters represent single letters. And you know about that. That's what we have today. Now, this is just for your general information. The Hebrew is alphabetic and is classified as Northwest Semitic language. In other words, there was a group of people, out of them grew a type of language, depending on, well, we might even say which tribe, whether Phoenician, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Ugaritic, were all from a common proto-Semitic alphabetic language system. This says it all pointed to some source of being Semite. And if you remember Noah, he had three sons, Ham, uh, Shem, and Japheth. Shem started the Semite group. Isaiah 1918 refers to Hebrew as a Canaanite language. So that's just pointing out that Hebrew came from the area of Canaan. Where was Abram from? Ur of Chaldees. Remember that was over in Samaria? in Mesopotamia, over by the Persian Gulf. Well, he came over, remember, to Canaan, and they developed the language there. What we have is Hebrew. Let's talk about the Old Testament text and versions. Now, we have different versions in English. You have the King James. You have the New American Standard. You have the NIV. That's the New International Version have the Net Bible, lots of English versions. We had all kinds of versions of the Old Testament also in different languages. So now we're going to look at that briefly. The earliest manuscripts of the Old Testament were composed in the 22 consonantal characters of the alphabet. Now we're back to the alphabet. Let's start with the alphabet first. 22 consonants, no vowels. They had the vowels memorized, or when they pronounced the consonants, they knew what the sound was. They didn't add symbols for the vowels until later on, much later on, in fact. So they just used the main consonants. Uh, they just used consonants, I should say. 22 of them. Transmission continued through the scribal schools until the time of the Masoretes. Now, we mentioned the Masoretes because they played a very important role in the copying and transmission of our scripture. When we talk about transmission, we're talking about how it got from one point to another. So how did it keep moving up through the generations? They made copies. Remember, these copies weren't set on some permanent type of material. Uh, it might be papyri or some sort of uh, animal skin or some sort of uh, reed flattened out to make a kind of paper thing. And this stuff would deteriorate and start to break apart, uh, you know, just like an old, old piece of paper. Uh, if you ever had an old, old book and the, the pieces are starting to fall out, maybe even crack and tear, you want to make sure you get a good copy. So you copy it and make it a newer copy on a fresher piece of paper. Well, that's what they kept doing over the generations. They didn't have printing presses. Made a lot easier, huh? They just throw the printing press on. So they had to hand copy it. The Mezzarites were very important Jewish, Jewish schools, uh, and they would do this. We see they did it up to 500 to 900 AD. So we're talking just over 1,100 years ago. They were still doing it still before the printing press. These were Jewish scribes and scholars who improved word divisions and added vowel points or signs. Notice they had the vowel points somewhere between 500 and 900 AD. 
pronunciation marks, and verse divisions to the Hebrew Old Testament. The Hebrew text today is called a Masoretic text, or the MT, which shows just how important the contribution by the Masoretes was. The Masoretes added marginal notes for improved reading and subdivided books into chapters. Chapter divisions and numbers to the chapters were added in the 16th century. That wasn't that long ago they decided to divide the chapters up, put numbers on them. So you see, when Moses wrote it, he didn't even, in fact, he didn't even divide words. Oh, they didn't have any verse numbers. They did this centuries later by these Masoretes. Does that surprise you? The changing political situation of the Jews, and you know something about their history, with their movement necessitated, that means called for, translations from the Hebrew to other languages. So as the Jews were moved out of their land, their land was conquered and they scattered to other lands, they took what copies they had and made it into the language of the place they were often at. All right. Now listen, <clears throat> in a moment we'll look at some of those copies. The more important translations were the Samaritan Pentateuch. Remember, some of them went up to Samaria. So they had their own Pentateuch. That's the law, right? Fourth and fifth century BC. Also important are the Aramaic Targums, which were pre-Christian paraphrases of the Old Testament in Aramaic. So these are people putting into their words what the scripture is saying. They may quote it uh, at times, but they may comment on it, put it in their words. But Aramaic was the language of the day as it was during the day of Christ, by the way. So what we're saying is, now we have the Old Testament Hebrew being translated into these different languages. The Greek Septuagint, which you hear me mention now and then, also symbolized by the Roman numeral LXX, meaning 70. 70 writers did the Septuagint. That's the story anyway. This came out of the impact of Hellenism. That's a big word that usually represents Greek-like on the Jewish people. So what we have here, let me explain where the, where the Septuagint came from. Uh, you know something about Alexander the Great. Well, he conquered that part of the world around 300 BC. His language of Greek became the language of the world in that area of the world, all right, from Greece over to Persia. People learned to speak Greek. After all, they had Greek soldiers. They conquered them by the Greeks. They started Greek literature, or they brought it over. So now people are speaking Greek as a common language. And that's why you have our New Testament written in Greek and not Hebrew, because it was a common language of the day. You live in the United States, your language is English. All right? There are many languages spoken in this country but many people who speak one of the other languages also speak English because that's the common language, you see. In fact, English, from my understanding, is a common language around the world. In many, many countries, they speak English and their own native tongue. So, when they translated the Hebrew, they wanted it into the language of the people that, of the language that the people were speaking. And they wrote an entire Bible, copy the entire Bible, Hebrew and Greek, um, and to combine it to the Septuagint, Septuagint. All right. Now, this was 250 BC, 250 years before Christ. Finally, we also have Latin, uh, Jerome's Latin Vulgate. Latin was an official language of the Romans. So now you have a Bible written in Latin. The Greek and the Latin, and another one that's important is the Syriac. We don't talk too much about that. It's called the Syriac Peshetta. It was around 400 AD. It came later. So these are sort of the big th three right here. The Septuagint, the uh, Vulgate, and the Syriac. But mostly you'll hear us talk about the uh, Septuagint here and the Vulgate. Remember the name Jerome, by the way, Jerome.
because he's the one that translated it into the Vulgate. So, that's some of our major versions. Versions, originally in Hebrew, translated into these other virgin, uh, versions, so people in other parts of the world would have their own copy of the Bible and their language. What do we have in the United States? The English versions. All right? Now, you go to uh, Spain, you'll have Spanish versions or French, French versions, and so on. Textual criticism. Well, you hear me mention that sometimes in our studies. Uh, this is a tough subject. It's a tough thing to explain sometime, but I'm going to attempt it, so just listen the best you can. <sighs> Due to the copying and translating from all these languages, copies increased and spread the number of copies of manuscripts so that there are thousands of copies in different languages from these various time periods. So let's just pause a second. Let's say uh, uh, your particular church got a copy of the scriptures. Well, what if they start up a new church? Well, they'd want a copy too, so people make copies of copies. And it's spread around. Well, if you're a missionary, he'd want a copy. So he goes out, and maybe he copies in his spare time. He gets another copy. So you get all these copies. They call that proliferation, the increase and in spread of it, okay? The copying was done by hand, which led to errors of transmission. These human errors of sight, hearing, writing, memory, and judgment are called variants, or variant reading of the text. So what would happen is when they copied it, sometimes they made a mistake. They copied the wrong letter, the wrong word, put it on the wrong line. And sometimes I'd have someone, okay, let's make five copies. You five guys are going to listen to me read it. And then you copy it down. So he starts reading the scripture real slow. But they mishear a word. Or he has a certain dialect they don't pick up on. And so they write the wrong word down. So now you've got an error. But see, that's not from the original, is it? It's from a copy, probably a copy. So you'd have all these different types of errors. Or what did that say I just read? And he'd mess it up in transmitting it, you see, and, and writing it down. Have you done that yourself? What did I just read? You had to go back and read it again? Sure. So we have, so all we have is copies of copies. No original manuscripts exist as far as we know. You wouldn't expect them to exist. They'd be too old to be deteriorated. This is where textual criticism or lower biblical, biblical criticism comes in. Now, so how do we determine which copies are best like the original? We use textual criticism. We're trying to determine which copies are most like the original. Textual criticism is the science of manuscript comparison. The goal is to discover the text that is closest to the original manuscript. They gather, sort, and evaluate the variant readings. The evidence is weighed and rated as to how close the text is to the original. It's important to know that even with all the technical processes and expertise involved here, for centuries the fundamental integrity and veracity of the Bible is intact. Now, what am I trying to say here? Even with all these copies over these generations, most everything is still accurate. So you can't really question the Bible's truthfulness or what we call its integrity. This is still the Bible. This is still what it's saying. Now, if I left a letter off on a word, you could probably figure it out by looking at it or looking at the context, right? So, we can come to that safe conclusion. In other words, none of these methods <clears throat> used over the centuries have seriously challenged the vast majority of accepted scriptures so that one can say we have, one can say uh, we have an accurate Bible. In other words, none of these methods used over the centuries have seriously challenged the vast majority of accepted scriptures 
so that one can say we have an accurate Bible. This shows the remarkable state of preservation and accurate transmission. This is due to the meticulous, you know what meticulous means, very detailed, careful methods of transmission and reverence, that great respect for the manuscripts, given the biblical manuscripts, Hebrews and Christians alike view it as inspired, that is, God breathed. You learn the basics, you know something about that. At the same time, the Holy Spirit, who not only inspired the human authors, superintended through history the preservation and transmission of the scriptures to the canon we have today. The canon is another word for our body of scriptures. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So the Holy Spirit, just as he inspired the writers, the original authors, he supervised the accurate transmission and preservation of the scriptures. Just think of it. We have writings, and some of us, our own copy, that go, that's in our language, that goes clear back to Moses. Now, this is an interesting topic, the Dead Sea Scrolls. The, dead, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, sometimes we indicate it by DSS, prove this out. In other words, this proves out the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls help us prove how accurate the scripture is, how accurate the copies have been. The discovery of these scrolls began in 1946. Prior to the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest copies of the Hebrew text was what we call the Cairo Codex, 8900, Peter, Petersburg Codex. These are just different copies, okay? 916, both of those had the former letter prophets. So we have copies that were discovered. They go back to 900 and 916. But they only had part of the Bible, the former and latter prophets. We call them like the major prophets and the minor prophets today. Well, to some degree we would. Let's remember some of them had different titles. But anyway, just part of the Bible. Let's just keep it simple. The Aleppo Codex, 900-950, and the Leningrad Codex of 1008 was the entire Old Testament. So what we're saying is 900 A.D. is the oldest text that we had. Let's get a timeline for a moment. All right. Now we're talking about 900 AD. All right. So there's the time of, we'll just put this about, just to be simple, year zero. So you have 900 AD. That's a long time ago, wasn't it? We're in 2000. All right. The oldest Hebrew text we had was 900 AD. Nothing older. These are copies, copies of copies, right? The rest are deteriorated, lost, or gone. Dead Sea Scrolls come along. They find them in a cave near the Dead Sea. Date 250 B.C. 1150 years difference, right? So this was a great discovery. So are they going to be like the 900 AD copies? They dug them out, they examined, and they were remarkably, almost exactly the same. Now, they might have had a few errors because they were copies too, but they were the same. And that just shows you how even between this period, they were very careful in making right copies until they got to the 900 AD period, you see? So all we're saying is, and this is called transmission, All right, it got transmitted through the copying and the preservation. It never got lost. God watched over all this. He wasn't going to let the world lose his scriptures. And he wasn't going to let them have only an inaccurate copy or lack of complete Bible or, or a complete Bible, you see. He's going to make sure we get a complete Bible and it's accurate because he wants the human race to have his word. So let's go back to our notes. By now I kind of explain what I'm getting ready to read. 
The discovery of these scrolls began in 1946. By the way, it was a, a shepherd boy who threw a rock or something inside a cave and heard a ding and went in there, and they were actually written on some sort of metal. Or it was the container. He broke, I think, uh, something that they were stored in. And in the desert, these, these old scripts kept quite well, and they kept discovering more and more scrolls for like 10 years. As they started, uh, as the explorers went in and started digging through these caves, and they came up with all these copies, and man, they had a lot of good scripture copies, the uh, complete books, and they could compare them with what we had. Well, anyway, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls date back to 250 BC, 1150 years before the latest Hebrew manuscript at their discovery. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were compared to the much later codices, that's another word for codex or, or copy of scripture mentioned here, the agreement was remarkable, showing the accuracy of transmission over the centuries. Well, you've heard me mention the word canon several times. Let's talk about it. Canon comes from a Hebrew word meaning the reed or stock of a papyri or oil grass. Uh, since reeds were used as measuring rods, for making straight lines, canon came to mean measure or measuring rod, or measuring reed. It was used as an expression in reference to the Holy Scriptures. When applied to the Hebrew Scriptures, the idea of canon has both. It has both. So it's a measure, and it also is an expression in reference to the Holy Scriptures. When we talk about canon, we're talking about the measured book or Scripture. When applied to the Hebrew Scriptures, the idea of canon has both. It implies the individual books of the Old Testament demonstrated the inherent quality of divine inspiration and recognized as the Word of God. Now, what I'm trying to say here is the canon of Scripture is recognized as divinely inspired and the Word of God. <clears throat> the canon of Scripture was considered supremely authoritative for faith and religious practice by the Hebrew community and became the measure by which later books of Hebrew history, tradition, and teaching are evaluated. Formation of the canon. Now this is a, a series of stages that they used in developing how we get our canon. We don't have detailed documents that show the various steps and how these ancient documents were selected no doubt that it was involved and took centuries to do. The following steps take into account what data or information we do have. So we're going, to back, going back to how did we get something written on a piece of paper and put where we could collect it into a book that we have in our hands today. Well, let's look at some of those early stages. Stage one authoritative utterances. God's communication first came orally. In other words, it was spoken in most cases. Then you'd hear things such as such formulas as hear the word of the Lord, like in Isaiah 1.10, or this is what the sovereign Lord says, Ezekiel 5.5. 5. That would have been identified as inspired by God. These authoritative utterances would have been passed on as the word of God and received as oral tradition. So it was done by remembering what someone said and pass it on and pass it on and pass it on. You can compare Genesis 48, 1 through 7. Stage 2, formal written documents. At some point, these oral traditions were written down and preserved for the Hebrew community. In many cases, the recording would have come later than when originally spoken. Sometimes written, then spoken, like the Ten Commandments, right? That was written down by God in Mount Sinai. Sometimes we have a record of when it was written, like in Joshua 8.32. There in the presence of the Israelites, Joshua wrote on stones a copy of the Law of the Moses. So what we're saying is these collected oral traditions, they were starting to be written down. And then stage three, they're collected. Collected written documents. At some point, the documents were gathered and put together. It was a lengthy process, like the Psalms. It took some 500 years. It took a long time to write the Psalms, then to, then to collect them. 
It was comprehensive. That means it covered everything. Given the number of ancient sources cited in the Old Testament that still are unknown. So what we're saying is it even included some of the things that were quoted from other books that aren't in the Old Testament, like the books of the wars of the Lord. Now, just think about it. Of course, there were other books besides the Old Testament in those days. Not all of them are part of our scripture, though. They were referred to. There's a couple of them. books of the wars of the Lord. Numbers 21, 14, the book of Jasher. Joshua 10, 13. We don't have those books. They're not part of scripture, but they're referred to. And all that's doing is telling us that there were other books and they had something in them that was accurate and they put it in the scripture. All right. It's kind of like a footnote almost. So they were comprehensive and that they had everything noted that needed to be noted. Next paragraph, assembling the documents signified the value, authority, and prominence, the high place, of the writings in the religious life of the community. For the Hebrews, these books demanded special attention. We would expect them to, wouldn't we? Stage four, sorting written documents and fixing a can. So now they have to sort them out. The exact procedure of how this was done is not known. We would expect that there was large agreement among the Hebrew religious leaders. We would assume that these men were all so guided by the Holy Spirit, all this taking place over the course of Israelite history. The Hebrews had a fixed canon. In other words, established. They had picked it out, put it together, and said, this is it, well before the time of Christ. Christ himself appealed to the threefold division of the Hebrew canon, consisting of the law of the prophets, excuse me, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. That scripture, Luke 24, 44. So by Jesus' time, they'd also already had the Old Testament, of course, and he even referred to it in its three divisions. We can reasonably point to four key periods when a major collection of the documents would have taken place. Now what this is saying, when do you think they collected them? Remember, we're talking about a, a period of a period of about a thousand years. Well, after the Exodus, during the Sinai experience, don't you think they'd have collected all those laws that Moses wrote and put them together? I think so. That makes good sense. During this shift from the theocracy to the monarchy, so now we're going from the time of well, the judges to the kings. That'd have been a good time. That was a major shift. During the fall of Jerusalem, exile of Babylon, remember they'd want to take copies over to Babylon. Now, there might have been some left in Jerusalem, but they're probably hidden and buried. Because remember, Jerusalem was destroyed. In post exilic Jerusalem with Ezra the scribe and Nehemiah, if you followed our history, you went through our first books, you know Ezra and Nehemiah come at the end of the history, and they're back from exile into the land. And there they would collect them again. So we got everything, you know, kind of like that. Get it all together so we can start our proper worship again. Our next section is called the criteria for selection of the canon. Criteria is another word for standard. How do we decide which books go into the Bible? You ever tried to take a trip and... Someone will tell you, maybe your mom or dad will say, uh, all right, we're going to take a trip. Put whatever toys you want to take with you in a backpack. So now you have to sort them all out and say, which ones do I have room for, which ones do I like, and so on. Well, you had to have a standard. The ones you like, the ones you play with, the ones that you don't want to get lost or broken maybe. So there's a criteria for selecting the canon. The New Testament, let's start our reading. In the New Testament canon, they look to the apostles for the authorship and basis for canonicity. Other criteria are considered for the Old Testament. They don't have apostles in the Old Testament. Inherent divine inspiration and authority recognizable by the leaders of the Hebrew religious community through the elimination of the Holy Spirit. That's a long sentence, but basically what we're saying these religious leaders, the Judaizers, that is the Jewish, the Jewish leaders, let's put it that way, 
the Hebrew religious community, their leaders decided this seems inspired or this looks inspired or this is inspired. That would be one standard. Second, authorship was another key criteria or standard. Human writers largely held divinely appointed offices of leadership, such as lawgiver, who was that? Moses, judge, priest, prophet, and king. So someone who was recognized as a appointed leader who wrote it. So we have books written by kings and judges and priests and prophets, don't we? Third, the content of the book was examined for consistency of teaching. Does it match up with the other parts of Scripture that we believe are inspired? An overall unity of theme and message with the covenant experience. They talk about the covenant. They talk about the law. Are they relating what they write to the covenant or the law? As recorded in other books, recognizes the word of God. So is it consistent with what the other scripture says? You wouldn't want something blatantly contradictory, right? You'd have to question whether that was supposed to be there or so. So they have a bunch of writings that contradict the scripture, say, nope, not part of the canon, you see? Lastly was the use of the books by the Hebrew community would have influenced the selection. The books that were studied, read, composed, and obeyed by the Israelites came to be recognized as part of the canon. So have you been using this book for, for four generations? The Psalms, yes, that's part of the canon, you see. An important assumption here is the Holy Spirit who inspired the writers would have also supervised the selection process of which books belong to the canon of scripture. Let's talk about canon history. The understanding of the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament or Old Covenant comes from both the Old Testament and the New Testament scriptures. Why do we call the Old Testament or the Old Covenant the old one? Well, we look at the scripture. Now, let me give you a review. Remember, Moses wrote the Mosaic Law, what became the Mosaic Covenant. So when we talk about covenant, we're talking about the law written by Moses, the old covenant. How do we, why do we call it old? Here's why. In the Old Testament, Jeremiah wrote of a new covenant in the future. Here's, what, here's the verse. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. So you already have the one with Moses, but there's a new one coming. So when they get the new one, what are you going to call the other one? The one of the past? We call it the old. That's what happened. The new covenant, that new covenant, the New Testament, making the former or first covenant the old covenant. Hebrews 9, 15 through 28 talks about the first covenant. Thus we have the Old Testament covenant and the New Testament covenant. You know, testament means covenant. Have you figured that out by now? So, that's why we called the Old Testament the Old Testament, and the New Testament the New Testament. One's in the past, one's new. In Judaism today, the Old Testament is called the Tanakh. I bet you didn't know that. The Tanakh. That's an acronym for the three parts of the Old Testament. The Torah for the law, there's where you get your T, the N, Nevi'im, or prophets, and the Ketuvim, or writings. So they take the T, the N, and the K, throw in a vowel, and they got the Tanakh. In our English canon, we have 39 Old Testament books in the canon. Okay? The Hebrew counted 24 books in the scriptures. Why 15 difference? You notice the difference, 39 to 24? Because they combine 1st and 2nd Samuel to 1 Samuel. 2 Kings to 1 Kings, 2 Chronicles to 1 Chronicles, Ezra and Zemi to 1 book. So there you, you're minus 4, right? Then they take the 12 minor prophets. The 12 minor prophets were counted as a unified book of the 12. So there you go. There's 4 up here. And now only one more so they're minus 14 or rather 
Is that right? Or 15 difference? 24, 30, 15 difference. So they're minus 15 difference. Thus, the Hebrew canon contains 15 fewer books than our Old Testament of 39. Of course, all the material is the same. Now, if you studied Samuel with me back in the survey, I think I pointed all this out. It was considered one book, same way with Kings and Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah. So there you go. I haven't got to the prophets yet. That's coming. In the Hebrew scriptures, the names or titles for the books were usually taken from the first line or verse of the text. English titles were derivations from the book headings in the latter Greek and Latin versions of the Old Testament. Now, you ought, you ought to understand all this by now. We've talked about the Greek versions, the Latin versions. And even in some of the books we've already studied in our survey, I pointed out where we got the title from the Hebrew name or something in the first line or where we got the English title, you see. Canon order. How do they place them in order? What order do they put them in? It appears that the Masoretic scribes did not establish any guidelines for standardizing, standardizing the order of the Hebrew canon. Today's English versions repeat the Old Testament canon under the order of Jerome's Latin Vulgate, including the Apocrypha. Now we'll talk about that in a moment, but let's just talk about the order. We got our order from the way Jerome arranged his Latin Vulgate, the Latin version of the Bible. Canon Confirmation the Hebrew canon was established and fixed by the religious leadership of the Hebrew community. Now we're talking about the Old Testament. Latter rabbinic and church councils merely affirmed this, but did not determine the canon. So what we're saying is, through the centuries, the Hebrew rabbis, that's their teachers, their scholars, and the church councils, as we get into the church period, just said, yeah, that's the canon. It was stamped with their approval, a collection of divinely inspired and authoritative books acknowledged as the Word of God. So, this is how we got our Old Testament canon. Now, you may not be aware of it, but there are many books that people have tried to say, well, this should be in the Bible. One of those collection of books is called the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha means hidden. In our use here, these were a collection of books during the period between the Old Testament and New Testament. So, let's go to timeline for a moment. This timeline is not going to work. So we're going to have to do another one. All right, here we go. Timeline. This time we're going to put the cross about right here. All right. New Testament. Well, we know the events of the New Testament started with Christ, right? So we'd probably put them about right here. All right. The time of Christ, New Testament, John the Baptist, all that. And we have our Old Testament period back here. I'm just going to put OT. You know what that means, right? This is New Testament period. So, Old Testament ended, the writing ended about 500 B.C. Well, right here, let's just put 1 A.D. This is the intertestinal period. During this time, other books were written, but they weren't written by God's people. That is, they weren't written by prophets or priests or kings that had the authority to put books in the canon. So back here, by 500 BC, all the books for the canon were completed. They'd already been written. Malachi, one of the last prophets. All right, so this period right here in the big parentheses is called the intertestament. Now, why would they call it intertestament or intertestamental? Big long word, intertestamental. I think I got that right. Between the testaments. Between the completion of the Old Testament canon and the beginning of the New Testament canon. Intertestamental. All right. Back to the definition of Apocrypha. Apocrypha. 
This is called the intertestamental period. These books were hidden in two senses. Remember the word means hidden. Hidden away because of their esoteric nature. Now what does esoteric mean? Well, it's kind of a special knowledge understood by a few. That's probably a good way to define it. Well, that's too esoteric for me. Or this, or they'll say something, well, this is esoteric. Only a few of us know what it means. Have you ever heard those people? I hope not. Anyway, they thought they had a special knowledge, a special insight. So that's one meaning of the word. Or, as we have it here, hidden away because they were never recognized as a canon by the Hebrews. So what we're saying is apocryphal writings were never recognized as belonging in the canon. The Apocrypha is a collection of 14 or 15 books, depending on how you count them. They were composed by Jewish writers between 200 B.C. and 100 A.D. They are originally written in Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, preserved in, preserved in Latin, or Greek, Latin, Ethiopic, and Coptic. Coptic's the um, Egyptian language, Syriac, and Armenian. So, so they were composed here, it's got them between 200 B.C. and 100 A.D. So maybe I could stretch that line a little bit more. All right. Uh, 100 A.D. would be about right here. Maybe I could put it up here. If you want to get a little more precise. All right. So we're talking about between this period. All right. <clears throat> I should agree with my own notes, huh? These books were added to the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, one by one, and completed by 250 B.C. So remember I talked about the Septuagint, the Greek copy of the Old Testament? So people started adding these apocryphal books to the Septuagint so that when the Septuagint was finally done, they had included these apocryphal books. They were separated from the Hebrew scriptures and never recognized by the Hebrew community as scripture. Don't miss that. They were kept separate. The Jewish leader said, no, they're not part of the canon. They don't measure up to the canon. But if you want to keep them in the same book, make sure you note that they're not part of the canon. You might have them in a separate section with a big uh, page or two that explains not part of the canon. But the Jewish scribes made no note of this, which led, they didn't note it. They didn't put anything in there that said it doesn't belong. And then it led to the Greek-speaking Christians who started using the Septuagint to adopt the Apocrypha as part of the Greek Bible. So because they didn't note that it was separate, they assumed because it was in the same book, it must be part of the canon. Now remember, they still didn't have printing presses. So you have all these books together saying this is our Bible, and that included a bunch of these apocryphal writings. Christian scribes continued to copy it into their Bibles after uh, A.D. 100, continuing the transmission. So it kept right on. So go back to our timeline. So they wrote them back here. Let's just put apoc. All right. They kept right on continuing to put them in and calling them part of the canon. But they weren't. So I'm going to put a big question mark. They weren't part of the canon. They never were. So what happened? Let's continue. This led to the confusion in the early church. Some accepted it and some did not. Jerome, remember, he's the one that wrote the Latin Vulgate, included it in his Latin translation to the Vulgate, which he finished in 405. Furthering the issue, Pope Damasus, that's the Catholic Pope, commissioned the Latin translation of the Old Testament as the popular edition of the Bible for the Holy Roman Church. So, the Pope made it part of their Bible. He says, it's official, it's part of our Bible. So now the Catholics have a Bible that includes a bunch of writings that shouldn't be there. And they're not noted as being separate from the canon. You can understand how that's a big problem. See why they do that? Well, they're not being careful, for one thing. 
not being careful. Jerome objected and noted it in his Vulgate, but later recensions included Jerome's notations, excluded them. So Jerome knew they didn't belong in the canon. When he did his Vulgate, he said, does not belong in canon. But then as they made copies of his canon, they left those notes out. So that people soon, most Latin readers, saw no distinction between the Old Testament and the Apocrypha. Along came the Reformation. When the Reformation come around, oh, around 1500 or so, A.D., during the Reformation, the issue came up again and came to the forefront in church discussion. When the Reformers, that's your people who helped reform the church away from the Catholic Church, these people became the Protestants. When the Reformers started doing their own translations into the language of their, that should say, their own people, so, we, so when the reformers started doing their own translations into the language of their own people, they discovered the Hebrew Bible had no apocrypha. Then they either left them out or noted them as separate and inferior. The Puritans are credited with leaving it out altogether from their English Bible. And this is still true of most Protestant versions today. I doubt that your modern version has an apocrypha. Though you can find it in some, some versions of the King James, but it's noted as Apocrypha. Now, the Holy Roman Church responded to the Reformers at the Council of Trent. This is when they all get together and say, what are we going to do as the Roman Church? They affirmed it by affirming the Vulgate as the Bible of the true church and pronounced the Apocrypha equivalent to the canonical material. In other words, the Roman Catholic Church during this council 1545 to 15, 16 six, excuse me 1545 to 64 this is AD of course they said the vulgate is our bible today the apocrypha collection is called the Deutero canon and was substantiated by the Vatican Council of 1870 even in 1870 they reaffirmed they stated again yeah apocrypha is part of the bible the Roman Catholic Church appealed to it for such doctrines as the concept of purgatory. Don't know, you don't know about that. I'm not going to teach on it, except to say that it's a false teaching, merit for good works, and the practice of prayers for the dead. So they put in a work system. They pray for the dead, which the Bible never tells us to do, and they believe in purgatory. That's kind of a place in between heaven and hell. All right, silly, silly idea, but it doesn't come from the canon. It comes from the Apocrypha. The Westminster Confession of 1647, you're getting some church history here. That's a Protestant, rejected the inspiration and authority of the Apocrypha and refused to accept it as part of the canon of Scripture. So you have the Protestants against the Catholics here on what's our Bible. I thought I'd list for you the books of the Apocrypha. I had to scan this in. It's not very clear. I apologize for that. But here's some of the books that are in the Apocrypha. Now, some of these do have good historical value, but some of them are just myth. I've used 1 Maccabees in our study in Daniel. I think maybe 2 Maccabees as well, okay? Uh, so you can see these names here. There's 15 listed. Notice some are for teaching, some religious, some for romance, some history. That's the Maccabees. Some prophetic. And legendary, look at this one down here, 14, Bell and the Dragon. That sounds like a fairy tale, doesn't it? Another set of books, you say, you mean there's more besides the Apocrypha? Yeah. Look at this one, Old Testament Pseudepigrapha. Yeah. Intertestamental, intertestamental Judaism. All right, this is the religion of the Jews. Produced another set of extra canonical books distinct from the Apocrypha known as the Old Testament Pseudepigrapha. This is 18 books that were composed by Jewish writers between 200 B.C. and A.D. 200. So this is 18 books 
were composed by Jewish writers between 200 BC and AD 200. Although these books were kept outside the canon by both Judaism and Christianity, they circulated and were read in the early Christian church. The New Testament Jude quotes one of them, First Enoch, and alludes to the assumption of Moses. So this is just saying that sometimes they had some historical value. And here's one case in Jude where they actually used one of those books and put it in the uh, canon. Just part of the book, a saying in the book, okay? Not the entire book, just a saying from it. And here's a list of the pseudepigrapha. All right. I'm sure you probably never heard of a lot of these. Well, that ends our lesson on the formation of the Old Testament canon. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we do thank you that you have provided for us this information so we can understand how we got our Bibles. We recognize that through your Spirit, you not only had the Bible written down, but preserved and transmitted over the centuries so we can have it in our hand today. We thank you for that. Challenge us with what we've heard today. In Jesus' name, amen.